As above, so below may seem like just another found footage horror film in a seemingly endless barrage of found footage horror films. And yeah, I guess if you boil the film down to its most basic level, that's the case. But As Above So Below has so much more going on just below the surface and takes influence from one of the strangest places, the Divine Comedy, Dante's Inferno, and the Nine Circles of Hell. So let's talk about it. And of course, spoilers. So if you haven't watched the film, do that first, then come back. I'll be waiting. Well, not literally waiting because I wrote this part of the script and set it into a microphone well before you watched it, but you get the gist. Before tackling the subject of this video, I'm going to have to give a brief plot rundown of both The Divine Comedy and As Above So Below. First, we'll take a trip to hell. Inferno is the first part of Dante Alighieri's 14th century poem, The Divine Comedy. It tells the journey of Dante through hell, guided by the ancient Roman poet, Virgil. If Dante is successful with his journey through hell, he will be able to enter paradise. The poem Colin depicts hell as nine concentric circles of torment located within the earth. Those circles are limbo, lust, gluttony, greed, wrath, heresy, violence, fraud, and treachery. Each of these circles represent specific types of sins and provide a personalized torment and torture to those lucky enough to be chilling in them. Dante and Virgil travel through each of these circles and have a quick look around until they reach the ninth circle and are confronted by the devil himself. As above, so below is a found footage horror film released in 2014 and directed and co-written by John Eric Dodal, who also directed the Poughkeepsie Tapes, Quarantine, which is a remake of Wreck, and Devil, which is that one about Satan in an elevator. The film follows Scarlet, an accomplished professor of archaeology and an alchemy scholar who is searching for the fabled Philosopher's Stone. The alchemical substance was originally discovered by Nicholas Flamel and is rumored to be capable of turning base metals into gold or silver and is able to grant eternal life. She has come to France in search of the stone and to continue the work of her father, who searched for the stone for most of his life, but was ridiculed by academia and committed suicide by hanging. On the night of his death, he tried to call Scarlet, but she didn't answer her phone. This has haunted her ever since, because she feels like if she answered that call, he might still be alive. Scarlet tells those around her that finding the stone would be a monumental archaeological discovery, but her true motivation is to prove her father wasn't crazy, not only to the world, but to herself. A man named Benji has also come to Paris to feel film a documentary about Scarlet's Philosopher's Stone adventure. They enlist the help of one of her friends, George, who was another nerd who helped Scarlet uncover that the Philosopher's Stone is in a secret area within the catacombs, an underground labyrinth that holds the skeletal remains of more than 6 million people. George is reluctant to help, as his and Scarlet's history is a bit shady, and he explicitly states that he will not go underground, as he has developed a phobia after the death of his younger brother when he was a kid. While having a sauce of the catacombs, a random bloke who is in no way dead tells them to contact a guy named Papillon and his friends, who are experts at exploring areas of the catacombs that are off limits. Scarlet ropes Papillon and his friends, Xerxes and Zeb, into taking them to the hidden part of the catacombs with promises of treasure. But George is like, nah fam, I'm out after this. But after the police rock up and try to arrest them, everyone is forced into the catacombs, where, after they enter a passage which Papillon says is evil, they start to experience loads of supernatural shit as they try to find the Philosopher's Stone and their way out. Comparing these two two plot summaries, the only obviously similar thing is they both involve characters going to an evil place. But just you wait because we are about to make some sweet connections that show that where the gang go and as above so below is actually the hell described in the Divine Comedy. Throughout the film, nearly every circle of hell is represented and in one way or another, each circle directly ties into the sins committed by each of the characters. So now's the time where I'll explain how all of the circles of hell tie into the characters and what happens in them as a result. Let's get say 10 panic. Limbo is the first circle of hell. This is where the souls of the dead go when they haven't committed any evil acts in their lives that would send them directly to hell, but haven't committed enough good acts to let them be in heaven. Those who are stuck in limbo are forced to exist in a guiltless eternity in a deficient form of heaven with the knowledge they have been exiled from God's presence forever. When the characters of the film enter the first circle, they encountered a man named Latope, a thought to be missing friend of the tunnel explorers that Scarlet enlisted in her search for the Philosopher's Stone. They had previously mentioned that Latope knew the tunnels better than anyone as he'd lived there for years. Even so, he refused to enter certain areas of the catacombs, but eventually he felt the desire to explore these areas and when he did, 
he never returned. His friends are shocked to find Latope, and when they ask him what happened, he scolds them for not searching for him. Out of all the characters, Xerxes seems to be the most upset by his words, a sign that she may hold guilt for not looking for a friend. Latope is acting super shady and tells the group to follow him as he knows a way out. But when they do, they notice that he seems to be moving extremely fast, as he is appearing down the hallways at an unnatural speed. The group is led to a hole in the ground, and Latope tells them the only way out is down. This is echoed in the Divine Comedy, where Virgil tells Dante, for the only way out of hell is to climb down to Satan himself. It is here where we learn some more details about George. As kids, George and his brother Danny were playing and entered a cave system when Danny became submerged in water and trapped. George told Danny that he would leave and try to get some help, but he became lost. By the time he got back with help, Danny had drowned. George feels like he betrayed Danny for not saving his life, and Danny may have felt betrayed because his brother never came back to help him. This is the sin that George will be forced to face as he moves through the circles of hell. It is the first circle where George's sin is first elaborated on in the tunnels. While exploring, the crew come across an old looking piano. George comments that the piano reminds him of the one he and Danny had. He says they only knew one song, Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean, but they could never finish it because the A4 key didn't work. Instead of just leaving the creepy piano alone, George plays the song, but as he hits the final note, it doesn't play properly, and he realises that, somehow, this is the exact same piano from his childhood. Then, the group has led to the second circle of hell, Lust. This is the first circle where the punishments of hell properly begin. In Dante's Inferno, Lust is depicted as almost completely colourless tunnels where the souls sentenced here are buffeted back and forth by terrible winds of a violent storm, never able to rest. The sound of the storm is said to be deafening and painful to hear. This is also the home of Minos, who judges the condemned and sentences each soul to its circle of hell by wrapping his tail around himself a corresponding number of times. In As Above So Below, as the group explores the tunnel, they reach a tight corridor where suddenly sound becomes muffled. They try to communicate with each other, but nothing is clear. Then a piercing sound surrounds them and they clasp their ears in pain, their screams muffled. The sound lasts for a few seconds before it slowly subsides. Minos does not appear, but you can hear a roar which may suggest his presence. This is the first instance in As Above So Below where the viewer is clearly shown a punishment found in the Divine Comedy. Latope's presence is the first hint, but the deafening noise is when the inspiration becomes clear. As Above So Below skips over circle three, gluttony. I think this is because Cerberus hangs out there and yeah, I don't know how you're going to fit a big boy like that down here. But the film does explore the fourth circle of hell, which is greed. People sentenced to this circle are those who preferred material goods over everything else. They are forced to joust each other, and their weapon is a large, extremely heavy bag of money, which is so difficult to move that they must resort to trying to move them with their chests. In the Divine Comedy, Greed features an enclosure that contains the Mark of David, an engraving of Plutus, who is a demon of wealth, and a buttload of treasure, which is also attached to a trap. And finally, a fake Philosopher's Stone, which can only be used once. Sounds like a fun place. In the film, the crew enters this circle after stumbling across a room with a dead guy inside, who appears to be a member of the Knights Templar, but is really looking good for apparently being dead for hundreds of years. They find an underwater passage which they swim through. When they all appear on the other side soaking wet, Latope is shown to be completely dry, implying that he simply appeared in the room. This is yet another hint that he is a spirit. They end up in a room where treasure is locked behind metal bars, and there is a painting on the wall depicting the Egyptian tale of the Earth God, the Sky Goddess, and their child, the Sun. Wedged in the wall is the Philosopher's Stone. Scarlet takes the stone, but behind her, the French crew pull open the gate blocking the treasure. Before Scarlet can warn them that it's a trap, the roof begins to cave in. All of them make it out alive, except Latope, who they believe has been crushed under the rubble. But Xerxes has a massive gash in her arm. Scarlet is able to use the Philosopher's Stone to miraculously heal her wound. But remember what I said about the stone being fake? Well, we'll get into that a little bit later. The group find a drawing of a door on a ceiling and the Star of David on the floor, which symbolises as above, so below. This this means because there was a door on a ceiling, there must be a door on the floor. And there is. They come upon a passage marked with the phrase, Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. The same phrase that is written at the entrance of hell in the Divine Comedy. They crawl through this passage and end up in the fifth circle of hell, Wrath.
In Dante's Inferno, wrath is a damaged, reversed version of greed, but is completely empty besides a filthy water entrance, which is what the group went through to enter it. When they enter the room, they find the same corpse of the Knights Templar dude, but this time his body has decayed. The film also skips over Circle 6, Heresy, and moves straight onto the coolest circle of hell, Circle 7, Violence. This is the area where the shit starts to hit the demonic fan. So in the Divine Comedy, the Seven Circle is home to the violent, obviously. It is divided into three rings. Violence against thy neighbor, violence against thyself, and violence against God. Instead of having the characters explore each of these sections, the film keeps it in one area but applies each of the sections to specific characters in their sins. So firstly, I have a theory of Cersei's sin. In the film, it isn't revealed like most of the other characters, but I believe her sin is her guilt for not looking for Latope. When they enter violence, Latope miraculously appears again, but he seems different. When Cersei tries to approach him, he lashes out. She tries again, but this time, Latope attacks her and bashes her head against the floor floor until she is dead. He then disappears. Scarlet tries to use the stone on her again to heal her wounds, but it doesn't work. Because like in the Divine Comedy, this Philosopher's Stone is fake and can only be used once. I believe Xerxes' sin is attached to Latote because she is clearly distraught when the crew come across him in limbo, and she is the only one who tries to approach him in this scene. Even when he lashes out at her, she persists. The rest of the characters, including his old friends, won't go near him. Also, when Latope does kill Xerxes, he disappears and doesn't appear again for the rest of the film. I believe this is because he is Cersei's sin. Of course, it could be that once he killed her, the writers felt they didn't need him around in the story anymore. But considering how so many events in the film tied directly to the Divine Comedy and sins, I just can't sit here and believe she wasn't associated with Latope. My theory does sort of fall apart as atoning for one's sins plays a clear role in whether the characters get to live or die in the film. Before her death, we never see her really apologizing for abandoning Latope, and even when she approaches him in violence, she she is not apologizing. There are actions here show that she cares for him, but she never really gets a proper chance to atone, which is a problem in the film overall as the only characters who get a chance to properly atone are Scarlet and Papillon. Speaking of Scarlet, she atones for her sin much later in the film, but since she comes back here, I thought I should cover it now. As I mentioned before, violence is split into three sections, one of which is a violence against thyself. This part of hell is described as the woods of suicide, where all the souls who have committed suicide go. This is where her sin of not answering the call from her father before he commits suicide would be represented. Scarlet comes back to Circle 7 on her quest to return the fake Philosopher's Stone near the end of the film after George is severely wounded. It is here that she runs into someone hanging with a bag or a pillowcase over their head. She pulls the item off to find an image of herself hanging instead of her father. This could be a visual representation of her guilt or the visual representation of her desire to take his place. On her trip back to George after returning the stone, she runs into her father hanging. But instead of running away or denying what she had done, she apologizes for not answering the phone. After she atones for her sin, her father disappears. But back on track, after the death of Xerxes, the team continue on and enter the eighth circle of hell, fraud. In the Divine Comedy, fraud is a large funnel of stone shaped like an amphitheater, which connects to a series of 10 deep, narrow ditches or trenches known as Bolger. Each of the Bolger specialize in the never-ending torment of a particular aspect of fraud, but in As Above So Below, only Bolger 1, Panderers and Seducers, and Bolger 2, Flatterers, are touched upon. This is where we get insight into the sins of Benji. I haven't touched on Benji as the first hints to his sins take part outside of the catacombs, just before they go into the evil part of the underground. He sees a woman before the gang meets Papillon for the first time. Benji seems to focus on her and she seems to focus on him. And later, when they are first entering the catacombs, she is seen as some sort of leader of a weird cult that is singing. Again, the pair focus on each other. Unfortunately though, much like Xerxes and Zeb, we never really learn about the specifics of Benji's sin. These two instances with the women are the only hint of his sin we get before his death. His death in the Eighth Circle does give us some hints, but first, I have 
have to talk about how he died. The crew arrive at a tunnel that leads down from the 8th circle to the 9th circle, known as Treachery. Everyone gets down safely, but Benji is the last one to drop down. As he prepares, he hears the sound of a baby crying. He looks around and no one is there, but we see a glimpse of that weird woman who's been staring at him throughout the film. Suddenly, a woman holding a baby appears and screams before pushing Benji down the hole and he goes splat on the ground. The most agreed upon theory for Benji's sin is that he may have had a wife or a girlfriend who he had a child with and because he is attacked in fraud and falls to the ninth circle treachery, this indicates he may either betray it or hurt the woman or the child. But I have two little theories of my own. First is to do with why he is in France. We're told that Benji has travelled to France to film a documentary about Scarlet and her search for the Philosopher's Stone. Researching the eighth circle and the numerous Bolger led me to Bolger 1, which is Pandora and Sedusa. Those sent to this Bolger are people who deliberately exploited the passions of others and so drove them to serve their own interests, are themselves driven and scorched. I believe Benji did not want his girlfriend and new child to hold him back in his career as a documentary maker. He abandoned them and travelled to France, choosing his career over his family. And him filming the documentary is taking advantage of the death of Scarlett's father and her search for the stone so he can gain fame and fortune once the film is completed. The second is Benji's relationship with women and how he ties into Sedusa. Since Benji is the sole cameraman at the beginning of the movie, we only see what he sees or what he focuses on. In one early moment of the film, Benji comments on a woman's great legs. Now that could just be nothing and just him checking out a woman, but I think that gets thrown out the window when Benji sees the weird woman. We see the woman for the first time when Benji, Scarlett and George are entering the nightclub. The woman stares at Benji and he follows her with his camera as she leaves, and later when she is walking down the street. Also when the crew come across the cult members before they enter hell, that woman is seen again just like before. She stares at Benji and he stares at her. It is almost like he is infatuated by her, like he wants nothing more than to have sex with her even though he has a girlfriend back home. And finally she appears just before he is pushed by the woman holding the baby. Now you might think that she is the woman holding the baby, but I don't think so. In fact, I believe Benji did not only abandon his girlfriend and child, but he also cheated on her at some point. He did not want to be tied down sexually to one woman just because they had a baby together. And the reason why he died is because he wanted to have sex with the strange woman. He had several moments to try and be a better person and atone for his sin of cheating on his girlfriend by ignoring the strange woman. But he continued to comment on the looks of women and became infatuated with one of them. The strange woman appears before his death because she is the manifestation of his infidelity. I believe my theory of Benji's infidelity is further reinforced because he is pushed from fraud into treachery. And treachery is for those sinners who are guilty of treachery against those whom they had a special relationship. Benji cheating on his girlfriend perfectly falls into that category. It could be that his sin has nothing to do with Sedusa and in fact the strange woman resembles his girlfriend, hence why he's constantly looking at her, why she is in the tunnel with him just before he's pushed and is the woman that pushed him. I am not too sure about this as Benji is an extremely vocal person in this movie. He lets his thoughts be heard. If this woman resembled his girlfriend, I believe he would have said something about it. Not necessarily to the other characters, but at least to himself. If this were true, it would be a much better way of exploring his sin as it is a bit more clear cut. But as I said before, we never really learn anything about Benji's sin until his death. So the group is now in the ninth circle, which is treachery. and people who come here have betrayed someone who they had a special relationship with. Circle 9 is also where the devil resides with his three robed demons who in the film are believed to be Judas Iscariot, Atena, and Ptolemy. And since this is the last circle of hell, most of the shit happens here. Because so much happens to many different characters here, what I will do is focus on one of them at a time. That way I won't be constantly jumping between different people. First, we have the handsome French tour guide Papillon. His sin represents the betrayal of community. Papillon's sin is that he set a car on fire but didn't realise there was a young man inside. This man died, but Pion got away with it and denies being responsible for his death. The first instance we get a direct clue about Papillon's sin is when the crew are setting up at the start of the film. Benji notices a burn scar on his hand and asks Zeb and Cersei about it, but Zeb says that it's a sensitive subject and he won't dive into it. There is a moment before that that is tied directly to Papillon as well. When Scarlet, George and Benji first enter the catacombs during a tour, there is a young man chilling out who says if they want to recruit someone who can guard them through the tunnels, they should contact Papillon. They say thanks and turn away to leave, but when they turn around to look where the man was sitting, he has disappeared. 
You won't realise this until later in the film, but the man who told the crew about Papillon is the man who Papillon killed. Speaking of that, while exploring treachery, the crew stumbles across a car on fire with the young man sitting in the back seat. Papillon is visibly distressed, but even though he has been confronted with his sin, he refuses to atone. He portrays the man and himself for refusing to admit he had a role in the young man's death. Papillon is then pulled towards the car by an unknown force and screams for help, but whatever is pulling him is too strong. Once he gets close to the car, the young man reaches out and pulls Papillon into the inferno. The car then implodes or is pulled within itself and Papillon appears buried head first in the ground with only his legs popping out. This is known as a simoniac fate, and I probably butchered that pronunciation. Simony sinners are placed head downwards in round tube-like holes within rock, which is a fate that is debased mockery of baptismal fonts, and flames burn the souls of their feet. The heat is proportioned to their guilt. Now this is a punishment for the eight circle fraud, but the film puts it in circle nine and doesn't show Papillon's feet being burned, as what is described in the Divine Comedy. Honestly, I don't really have a problem with this because it is still a really cool visual. Shortly after Benji dies, the crew are crawling through a small tunnel littered with bones. This is where George sees his brother trapped underwater. He moves the bones away and asks everyone for help so he can save his brother. But of course, this doesn't work. He watches as his brother screams his name and dies yet again. There is one more thing that happens to George near the end of the film. As Scarlet, Zeb and George are trying to run away from Satan's henchmen, they come across these walls that have like non-human-like faces poking out of them. A monster thing jumps out of the wall and attacks George. The thing really fucks up George's neck and he is bleeding out, so Scarlet decides to go back to the room where she grabbed the fake Philosopher's Stone, but she realises there is no real stone because this film takes the Disney route and says the power of the stone was inside her all along, and she comes back and saves George's life. But since this movie has the whole everything ties into the Divine Comedy thing going on, shit ain't so simple. Even the monster from the wall seems to be connected to George, and it all has to do with its identity. You see, the monster is believed to be the demonic, disfigured soul of the historical Cain of the Old and New Testament. You know the story of Cain and Abel, the two sons of Adam and Eve? They agree to make sacrifices to God, but God favored Abel, so Cain goes ahead and murders Abel. Cain shows up in the night circle, which means he is guilty of treachery against someone close to him. Identifying the monster as Cain is necessary for this theory to be true. Cain attacking George may be a representation of a brother killing a brother. So Cain did the dirty on Abel, right? And George believes that he killed his brother. So since Cain and George's sin both involve the dead brother, Cain takes a big chunk out of George's neck. And this is what kit starts Scarlet's adventure of getting the real Philosopher's Stone. Once he is all better, the group begins to be chased by some hooded demons which leads them to a deep hole. Scarlet realises this hole is the exit, but first, everyone must atone for their sins. George tells Scarlet about the death of his brother and how he blames himself. Also, Zeb apparently had a sin to atone for. This is never hinted at throughout the entire film, but he confesses he has had a child but doesn't admit that it's his. They jump down the hole and are able to escape hell through a manhole, and that is the end of the movie. As Above So Below has a lot more going on behind the scenes than what audiences may initially think. Being inspired by the Divine Comedy and using themes from that poem to craft a story is a pretty big endeavour, and mostly I think the film pulls it off. I hope this video shows the lengths the screenwriters and directors went to to make As Above So Below something special, and I think they should be praised for that. My only issues with this film in regards to the Divine Comedy is boiled down to two specific things. The first is characters such as Benji, Xerxes, and Zeb didn't have their sins properly fleshed out throughout the film. This could have been a creative choice to leave things up to interpretation, but since the sins of the rest of their characters are explored, I believe this isn't the case. In order for the deaths of Benji or Xerxes to have meaning within the context of the film's inspirations, their sins needed to be explored. Zeb is the same. Because his sin is never discussed until the very end, his place in the film feels odd. It feels as though the writers only knew George and Skull would be at the end of the movie, but they needed someone else to act as a cameraman, so Zeb filled that role. My second issue is that the film establishes manifestations of sins as soon as the crew enter the catacombs, but forgets about it until the latter half of the film. There is no build-up. Once feet touch the ground of the catacombs, they find George's piano, Scarlet's phone rings, which I forgot to mention in the start of this video because I'm just fucking so good, and Latope shows up. But after that, nothing happens until Benji and Papillon's deaths near the end of the film. There is all this unused time between those two instances that could have further explored the sins of the characters or hell. This calls back to my first issue. The film could have used this time to actually establish the sins of Benji, Xerxes, and Zeb. Instead, the vast majority of the catacombs section of the film is Scarlet and George pretending they're in an Indiana Jones film. Though I have these complaints, I believe As Above So Below does a lot with the Divine Comedy. It takes an important iconic piece of literature and adapts it into an interesting and fun horror movie. I love movies that take advantage of
into the darker side of the human psyche to create horrific and confronting scenarios, and for the most part, As Above So Below does that really well. Sure, I wish more was done with it, but I cannot deny that it did a lot, and that is why I absolutely love this film and believe it is highly underrated. And with that, you have reached the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed my first video about a horror film. This was new territory, so hopefully it went well. If you liked this video, go on and like it. And if you're new here, subscribe and share your opinions of As Above So Below in the comments. And if you want to support the channel even further to help it grow, consider contributing to my Patreon. For as little as $1 a month, you get access to my exclusive Patreon series, Sunderland's Backlog, which is just a series of me picking up a game in my backlog and trying it out for an hour or so. How come demonic possession ever makes you, like, attractive? It's always turns you into like the most ugliest looking fucking thing in the world. It's pretty fun and laid back and it just lets me, you know, try some stuff out. You also get early access to the next video and a text shout out at the end of every video. $3 or more will give you access to all the previous tiers, access to a monthly Q&A video, and of course the ability to ask me questions for that Q&A video. And lastly, the $5 tier gets access to all previous tiers, but you will also get to vote in a poll to determine my next video game review and an audio shout out at the end of every single video. But because the whole, you know, thing we can't talk about is going on. What I've decided to do is that every single patron will be getting shouted out until this whole thing blows over. So I want to give a big thank you to Devin John Malone, Joey Monster, Marlo and Dottis, Randolph Sandolf, Sam Barclay, Slide of Tongue, and Walter for supporting the channel. It means so much to me and I love everyone who watches these videos and subscribes and does whatever the hell. And I hope to see you all guys in the next video because um, we're going to have some more fun. Alright, bye bye everybody.